who's going to be uh, talking with us about unlocking the power of consumer computed computer vision. It might be the uh, the display resolution. There we go. Well, that doesn't look right. Or that. I'll just mirror the displays. Oh, fantastic. So this is fun so far, yeah? All right. Uh, mirror. And let's see if we can do this. All right. I'm not Jason. I'm Jonathan. Hi. But we'll go with it. So computer vision is really providing, in, in our world at least, the foundation for augmentation. This is sort of Vudel's vision for taking computer vision, bringing it together with augmented reality. So in this case, we're using the mobile device's camera to recognize your face, see who your friends are, and actually give you an experience of seeing what they're posting on Twitter, Facebook, what their social feeds are. So we won't sit through this for too long. I think we get the point. We'll keep going. We also work on gesture and uh, other recognition concepts. So here's a little bit more of that. Um, this is some of our gesture recognition here. This is a woman brushing her hair and uh, moving her hand. Fantastic. But I, actually, I think one of the interesting things here, besides the face unlock, which I think we've probably seen in a lot of different places, um, is looking at the face and using that to actually change to a profile on a, on a specific television, and then using the hand to interact with the TV as well and to get some feedback from the screen. We could talk about that a little bit more later, but here's a little bit of this as well. So this is the kind of stuff that we're doing here. We were founded in 2007. Uh, we are, or at least we fashion ourselves to be computer vision experts. We have 80 employees in Palo Alto and Kiev in Ukraine. We are headquartered here in Palo Alto. Uh, you know, we have four patents that have been granted, a couple pending, eight to be filed, and they're all related to computer vision systems and use cases for them. Um, so as far as our view on augmented reality and computer vision, you know, let's, let's talk about where we're at right now. So face detect, pretty widespread. I mean, it's, it's pretty much on any phone that you have. Uh, whether you, you see it or not, there's some level of face detection going on uh, on the mobile side. Smile and blink detection is less so growing, but not as widely deployed. You don't see that everywhere. And, and the way that you would use something like that would be you know, identifying whether or not someone wasn't smiling in a photo, or if someone had blinked during that photo, what you do with it, right? Um, Samsung Gal Galaxy 3, launching with integrated face recognition. So this is one of the first devices that's shipping with integrated face recognition. And uh, at least in some of our view, uh, really the, some of the most widespread mobile apps that have augmented reality are, 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 a little, are a little gimmicky. I mean, so where do we go from here, right? We haven't seen a major exit in this space. You know, here we are as a company with uh, quite a lot of investment into our business. And you know, well, really, how much further along are we than where we started? So I'm going to skip this uh, demo of face detect and feature points. Uh, only because there isn't a way to connect the phone here. But I mean, the takeaway here is we have the technology to be able to take a mobile device, hold it up at a person, and detect not only their face, but their eyes, their nose, their mouth, and four points on the mouth, and the ability to help identify whether someone's smiling, uh, points on the eyes to identify whether you've blinked or not, this kind of thing. 
So just to continue to move along here. So most augmented reality is using a computer to look at something. Our focus at Vutal is what can your computer do when it looks at you? So the kind of things that we're working on here are things like auto sharing, organizing, right? so you never have to tag again. Um, gesture recognition and passive HCI, which is sort of the set-top box implementation of our technology, where you go sit down in front of the TV, TV recognizes you as your profile, and you can kind of interact with your hand uh, or with your face. So here's a little bit of background on our, on our gesture technology. Um, you know, we can kind of blow through these pretty quickly here. I mean, I, again, I think the, the takeaway is being able to really take the face recognition and the face detect and sort of integrate that with the gestures in, in order to provide both feedback to the user and, uh, and to get information about what's going on in the scene that we're looking at so that we can augment it with more information. These are some of the basic gestures that we recognize, so we'll just keep going here. Okay, so I mean, as far as mainstream progress, you know, we, we, we see deployment of augmented reality as sort of gimmicky in some mobile apps, and you know, there's some Qualcomm efforts to drive productization by offering open source uh, tech like Vuforia and FastCV. Um, but you know, computer vision is really plagued by not working 100% of the time, or, or even 99% of the time, or even 90% of the time. You know, right now we run into a lot of challenges with lighting conditions, normalization, uh, SNR, and, and really blurring artifacts that are introduced by our, our own <laughs> algorithmic adjustments in most cases, right? So, you know, it, it, it's imperfect. If the challenge is I have to be able to look at the scene and, and do something with it, if I, if I can't take that scene and process it in a way that I need to, uh, you know, I'm going to run into some issues doing anything with the scene. So in a lot of ways, this kind of creates the perfect storm for computer vision, right? More pixels require more processing power. So if you look at the mobile trends, on the CPU side, we've gone from single core to dual core to four cores, and you know, not a heterogeneous cores, right? So we're looking at adding a GPU onto the device where we can shift off some of the processing uh, for, uh, for a lot of the things that we're doing. If you look at the evolution of capture, you've gone from still and video capture to burst for things like HDR. Really the future, we believe, is, is a camera that's always on. A camera that's on your phone that you're not waiting for, that it's always capturing, and it's always taking in information that we're always processing and always able to do something with. You know, on the camera sensor, on the camera sensor side, uh, you know, really the, the, the battle in mobile devices used to be about megapixels. You see a phone like Nokia, you know, the 41 uh, megapixel 808 PureView camera that's come out. And, you know, and, uh, so maybe not so much a battle about megapixels anymore and what we do with them. Um, you know, we, we see a trend towards planoptic, which is sort of 40 light field information about the scene, right? So we're capturing all the possible angles and instances of light reflecting off of objects and using that to create an image that we can better process and do things with. Right? Um, same thing with array-based image capture, which is just dealing with variable image exposure, right? And, and you look at the, uh, the same thing in the ISP and image pipeline, so exposure bracketing, back to the variable exposure, you know, real-time HDR, and the FCAM implementations are on the way. So what it comes down to for us is sort of qualitative versus quantitative, quantitative improvements uh, on, the, uh, on the imaging side, right? So the, the imaging requirements for effective computer vision are vastly different than those of consumers, right? The image that I need in order to process and return some information is, is not going to be the same image that the, con the consumer is going to want to print out or keep or share with their friends. It's just, they're just not going to look the same. Uh, so really the goal is to find a balance between qualitative improvement for the consumer and quantitative improvement for computer vision. Uh, I mean, you know, the exposure that you want for computer vision, as an example, is not necessarily the one that looks best for the consumer. Oh, and well, that, was, that was as far as we got. So cool, perfect. Any questions? No. Yeah. It's not merely about white balance and exposure levels. Um, so you know, we, we, have a, we have a project that we're working on um, right now with, uh, with a customer where they're, they're actually bringing in like a, like, a, like a depth camera into play as well. So for us, it's not just, I mean, okay, so bottom line, low lighting conditions, always bad, right? Always bad. Uh, if, if we can't see, then we can't, we can't see. 
Uh, but there, there are other things that we can do in low lighting conditions, and whether that's adding like infrared uh, or, uh, or you know, bringing in like a depth camera that can you know, function a little bit better, um, there is helpful, right? So, you know, however you can extract the, the information, it's not just exposure and, and uh, no, no, noise normalization or balancing or anything like that. Because I mean, is we, we, we need to be able to get the data points, and however we can get those points in the field of view uh, is, is going to be the, you know, the, the best situation. So really what it comes down to is in every situation that we've had or every sort of client engagement, um, we, we end up having to really look at the use case. And in, in each use case, there's a different set of problems that we have to try to normalize for. Yes. You mentioned FCAM, phenoptics, light fields. Can you tell us the good and the bad and when it happens and what you're doing? Sure. If you can repeat that question, because again, it's not so much I uh, ask that you speak here or repeat that for the people in the room, it's for the people on the stream. So. Absolutely. And your question was about FCAM, and it was about Planoptic, and it was about array-based image capture, right? Yeah, Perfect. What's the good, the bad, the opportunities? So what's the good and the bad and the opportunities uh, between Planoptic and array-based image capture and, and FCAM? So, you know, for us, again, it comes back to the more information we can get. If we look at array-based image capture, you know, I'm going to have a variable image exposure, get a lot of different images that I can play around with. Um, you know, for us, the more data we have, the more useful it is. And, you know, working on sort of the consumer experience end, uh, there's, there's information that, that we need and that the consumer has no interest in. So, I mean, for us, you know, I, I think that there are advantages to sort of to each one here, and it, and it would just kind of depend on the use case. I don't have a lot of experience with AFCAM, so I don't know that I could reasonably answer a question about AFCAM. Um, but, I mean, on the point optic and array-based image capture side, I, I think that you know, the, the, there would be an advantage depending on the use case. So I, I don't know that I have a good answer for you on that. Okay, no more questions. Uh, question. oh. oh, here we go. Um, it seems like at the end you were hinting at that um, Consumer use for a camera for image capture, just taking photographs, is different than what you're looking for for computer vision. Do you see, um, you know, a, a large leap in improvement if there's specialized hardware on, say, a mobile device that's maybe not good for taking pictures, but just optimized for your computer vision type functions? Is that something that would be interesting, or do you think? I, I think it's something that would be interesting. I, I think there's a move towards um, towards sensors, towards cameras that that sort of have both, rather than trying to stick like a you know, depth a depth camera and just like a regular sensor on the on the phone. Is that something you you foresee like personally? Like I, w would I foresee like a like a prime sense going into a cell phone? Uh, probably not. But I, I mean, I, I could see that kind of an like that kind of thing being integrated, like the ISP level, right? So. Okay, well, Sweet. That, that looks like all of them. Thank you, John. Thank you.